It's, it's, it's been a little while. Yeah, it's been a little while. I haven't been able to. Well, the, now the restrictions eased, and I think you are able to book yourself in to get your uh, haircut, right? Starting. Yeah. Starting it's Monday. Monday. Yeah, starting Monday. Welcome. Are Are you trying to tell me I need a haircut now? No. No, I, I need a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Who uh, um, this is the uh, Nightwear. Uh, live, Knife War YouTube, a Facebook live about the uh, advanced sh knife sharpening. The, uh, my name is Naoto. I have the uh, Nathan on the other line who will be uh, watching all the um, comments, uh, questions that you may have. Um, advanced sharpening class is about the, uh, all about, ner not, not all about, but the, uh, I try to go about lots of uh, nerdy knowledges uh, on the um, sharpenings and the uh, nerdy knowledges about sh knife in general. So if you have any questions about any anything um, knife related, Japanese culture related, just let me know. Uh, but today uh, I'm going to show you how to um, we because it's the uh, we were we were kind of. Um, we, we have been doing this for quite a while, but we haven't done it for about a month or so. I kind of wanted to go back to basic of the advanced knife sharpening. What's advanced knife sharpening versus a uh, regular sharpening videos that we usually do. So I brought the, uh, well, I have this knife, um, Moritaka Ishime um, knife that's heavily rusted. Um, I'm going to show you how to, starting from how you remove your rust and going up to uh, how to take care of your stuff. Um, I'm gonna actually, I will, Nathan, I'll be right back. Just gonna. Yeah, sounds good. While, while Naoto's um, <clears throat> uh, just running off camera for a sec, um, also thank everyone for tuning in. I know we already kind of did the intro, but uh, it's nice to see you all again. Um, I know some of you tune in specifically for Naoto's kind of depth of knowledge for advanced knife sharpening. Um, for those of you that are into knife sharpening, we've got some really exciting news. Um, we finally got our shipment of knife sharpening stones in stock. Um, we were sold out of quite a lot of stuff for uh, the better part of the Christmas season. And so we just got a big shipment uh, today uh, of both Conroe grills and uh, knife wear sharpening stone. So we've got a bunch of inventory that's back in stock. Um, not only Conroe grills, which is pretty cool, but the 4,000 grit stone is back in stock. So um, if you're looking to pick yourself up any sharpening supplies, or if you're looking to get yourself a grill, we, we've got you covered. Awesome, I'm back. I, I just brought the uh, barkeeper's friend from our shelf here. We started carrying those. So the... Um, as the Nathan did a little bit of introduction on the uh, things, and we just got the uh, cone rolls and uh, uh, sharpening stones back. I'm pretty excited. So if you ever thinking of getting into the uh, knife sharpening, now it's great time for you to uh, get on there. Okay. Um, so today, what I said, you know, we are going to talk about how to sharpen a knife like this. Biggest difference between the uh, regular sharp knife sharpening videos that we still do it on Thursday evenings, I believe. Yeah, th Thursday at 7.15 Mountain Time with uh, Owen and Francis. They yeah. do more basic knife sharpening skills. So it's a good place to, you know, if you just want to learn how to sharpen a knife, you've never done it before or you're new to it, that's a good, good time to tune in. So the, if you want to learn how to do a basic knife sharpening, uh, tune in on the uh, Thursday evenings with the uh, Francis and Owen. What they are going to talk about is how to set the right angle, how you keep your angle at the same as you are sharpening it, okay? At the advanced level, what we are going to talk about is more general in terms of the, uh, the sharpness, the uh, how, how the construction of knife affects how, how sharp that the knife can be and everything. So really a big thing that we always focus on this uh, knife advanced sh sharpening is the how to thin our knives. What it is, is that when you are cutting, when let's say for example, when you have a knife and keep sharpening the edge, just the edge, just the edge by means the, uh, you know, Set your angle at 15 degrees. 
sharpen it a few times. Sharpening will remove your steel wall from the edge. So what can happen is that you're, say, losing about millimeter or two from the edge comes down here. The edge becomes very thick. So when you try to cut into something like a uh, potatoes, yams, anything really like root vegetables, dense root veggies, what happens is that it can act more like an ax. They try to split, split the uh, veggies instead of cutting through them. So what we like to do is to keep the profile of the knife as thin as we can. So what we're gonna do for something like this is to thin out this whole bevel before we actually go into the uh, sharpening process. So that's really the big- that's, that's all basically to keep the knife cutting as smoothly as possible, right? Exactly, exactly. When you're gliding into something, especially very dense uh, vegetables, it glides so much nicer with this. Okay, so. Um, so. Sorry to interrupt, Nato, but before we get into the, the technique, do you mind if I rattle off a quick question? We, we got a few questions on our Facebook right away. Awesome. So, so Rob Lee's wondering, um, we'll talk about this more later on, but maybe could you give us a quick demo on the proper way to strop a knife? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a uh, leather strop right here, and I have a uh, the ceramic honing rod right here. What I usually do is to hone the knife first to the upright position. For the Japanese knives, I usually use this narrow side of the uh, guard, align the knife. Alternate the side. Make sure you go from all the way from the heel to the tip very lightly. This will remove that the bigger burr. Then leather strop. I basically lift them about the angle that I want to sharpen. And from the tip to heel, very lightly, few slices like these ones. And if you have the finer side, I finish off with this. This will clean off that the uh, micro micro burr from the edge that keeps the uh, keeps a nice fine edge for. Okay. All right. Any any other questions, Nathan? Before I proceed? Yeah, j just a couple quick ones. These ones won't take long. Um, uh, Francois says thanks for the session today, but he's wondering if we could give a class on mirror polishing sometime. Maybe maybe next Friday potentially. I could talk about it. The mirror polishing, it will take very, very long time. The, uh, I've seen some of the uh, mirror polishing videos on YouTube. Um, they, you know, they fast forward the process, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, apparently what, the, what they, they're explaining is that it takes, uh, it took them like eight hours to bring it to the mirror polish. So I could definitely talk about how, well, I can definitely talk about it now, how mirror polishing is done. Uh, in our end, where we don't have the uh, big machineries to do, where in the, uh, in, uh, the like knife makers and polisher sharpeners and such, they have uh, much more, uh, say, machineries than the equipments to be able to do that kind of stuff, right? The, um, I have seen this super famous polishing com I visited this uh, super famous polishing company. Um, remember when the uh, the back of the iPhone or the iPad or I, I whatever was like mirror polished? Yeah. Um, it was done by this company in the Sanjo Niigata. He is the, um, he is the uh, teacher uh, of the uh, massage son doing the mirror polish. But the, uh, I went to visit them and uh, saw them how they polish uh, to attain that the mirror polish, it's just insane. Um, they have the buffs, like five different buffs to get the different, uh, even with the mirror polish, they have different levels of mirror polish. Uh, <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. it's insane. Basically though, what you want to do, if you want to attain the mirror polish, one, you get the nice um, face that's like really even. Uh, start from coarse uh, grit of sandpaper, progress all the way up. I sometimes do it even under running water, uh, not just a drop of water, but I just like run the faucet and polish them like that. And I, the, the very recent uh, picture that I posted on my Instagram, uh, I did it all the way up to uh, 5,000 grit uh, sandpaper. From there, 
you could you could purchase one of those the uh, diamond paste that goes all the way up to uh, ten thousand uh, or thirty thousand grit. Then you can patiently polish those ones to get the mirror okay. polish. Really, the patience patience is a key to get that the uh, polish on the uh, on the knife. Uh, there is no way no shortcuts. And again, those uh, those manufacturers uh, who does the mirror polishing knives, they do uh, like buffing buffing wheels and start from like aluminum oxide up from oxide and so on and so forth. Um, if you're buffing it with the, the buffing wheel, you have to be careful. You don't want to heat up your knife um, too much because as you heat your knives up, it will become a it will lose its hardness. Losing its hardness is very bad because if you lose the hardness, it doesn't take the edge. So, um, and, and, yeah. And sir, where do you find those pastes usually? Like I know Lee Valley has some good stuff for polishing. Yeah, that Lee Valley sells some like diamond paste. I got my sets from the Amazon. Amazon sells quite a bit of stuff there as well. Um, Amazon's good in a way that you could find the stuff that you don't usually find. You know, I like to buy off from the uh, regular, like uh, the local stores, but sometimes some some of the stuffs are very hard to find, right? So, uh, yeah, like totally. there, yeah. Well, yeah. For those of you who's watching on the YouTube, Facebook, uh, and Instagram, we're doing the live on the um, advanced sharpening. I'm going to sharpen this particular uh, rusty knife today. Okay, so cool. Let's what? get into it. Yeah. So before I go like get into the sharpening, I was just gonna show you how to remove the rust the easiest way. I have the rusty knife and I have this tool because barkeeper's friend. Barkeeper's friend is great. It's the uh, mild abrasive uh, that the uh, that doesn't um, scratch your knife as much. I just poured a little bit of barkeeper's friend on the, on the knife like this and uh, a little bit of water. I usually use cork. I don't think I have any cork here. So what I'm going to do use is my finger. Careful. <laughs> but the finger, yeah, don't just don't to go get too close to the edge. But barkeeper's friend, I was a little, I was a little scared. So I didn't go all the way to the edge here, but it does remove the rust pretty easy. So if you have the knife that made out of the carbon steel, it's really good, good idea to grab one of those. We do sell these guys on our website, Barkeeper's Friend. I think it was $7 or something like that. Um, I, I just threw the link into the, uh, yeah, I just threw the link into the uh, comments there uh, for a 12 ounce can, it's seven bucks. Yeah, or it's, it's you can grab a, something like this. Um, it's a rust eraser. We just got those back in stock as well. What you can do is this wet them and put that on the knife and just rub them like this. This is pretty good as well. It's pretty safe. You can, and it like acts like an eraser. So you can use something like this as well. So that's and that. Uh, speaking of stuff we just got back in stock, um, if anybody was keeping an eye on our sharpening stones uh, on knifer.com, we did just get restocked with all our stones. I know in the comments on Facebook, Brad Bill was saying he just ordered his 4,000 grit and his drilling stone a few hours ago because he was super, super excited for them to get back in stock. Oh, yes. Thank, thank, thanks, for, thanks for the wait. Thanks for the patience. Um, we, uh, the whole palette of the like seven palettes were um, chosen to be uh, randomly chosen by the Canada Boulder Service Agency to be inspected. Um, we have, yeah, so it delayed for three weeks. Uh, but these are all back in stock, so you should be able to purchase it right now at our website, thekniferer.com. So what I'm going to do today is to start thinning this knife using, started from the coarse grit and goes up to very fine, fine grit. What I'm going to start with is this, uh, this stone here. Um, this one here, the Shafton 200, glass 220 grit. What I like about this stone here 
is that the uh, it cuts quite fast. It doesn't leave as deep uh, scratches as the uh, some a knife for a 220. Knife for a 220 is great as well if you're going to remove the chips and requires a lot more thinning than the uh, this particular knife. So what I'm doing here is to it's kind of hard to maybe a little bit hard to see on the camera, but what I'm doing is that the I put the knife on the, the sharpening stone here. I'm just gonna change the little bit of angle on the Instagram here. I put the knife on here and press down to the little bit more closer to the edge. That creates, you see the knife moves a little bit. So only part that touches on the stone right now is this whole bevel. The, is there any chance you could tilt our camera down a little bit just so we can see what you're working on there? Because it's the um, Mac. Oh, it did. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, that's better. That's better now. So. Good. So. Awesome. So, yeah, they don't see my chomage here. It's good. So, what I'm doing is that just pressing down to the bevel right here and just go back and forth. You don't have to raise your angle or anything like that. It's just really flat on the bevel. Make sure though your fingers are on the, the bevel right here. You don't want to put your bevel right here that grinds the other parts, right? So make sure your fingers, these fingers are where you are sharpening. So it's important to know that this finger where you're putting the pressure on, this is where you are sharpening. The back side directly back of this, uh, where the finger is, that's where you're sharpening. As you move your finger, you are changing the position, right? So what I'm going to do is I keep going until, so how the Japanese knives or most knives are constructed are this way. It has the flat part or some, some knives have this, but it has the taper goes down like this. And at the edge, they have so-called micro bevel or Japanese call it the koba. Um, so in, I do see that the, it's kind of hard to see. Maybe if you have your knife around, take a look at your knife. You have the primary bevel, that's the bevel starts from right here. And you may have the secondary bevel at the, um, a very, very uh, micro fine bevel there. I'm gonna take this as a moment to show off, show off my, my Masakage Zero Guto that I hot rotted and thinned out yesterday. As, as I turn it in the light, you can see like this is the primary bevel where you've got that like, I don't know, two centimeters of steel that's been ground. And then as you turn it, it catches the light a bit and you can see that's your secondary bevel where that actual edge is. Well, I'm just gonna do it this way. Um, I was looking at the Instagram. Sorry, the uh, I'm not left-handed. It's a mirror image. That's why you see uh, me sharpening like a left-handed person. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do have some left-handed stuff. I know Chris Lord, who usually does these videos, is left-handed. Yeah. Um, we, we had a few, a few questions quick that I wanted to mention. Um, w one person, uh, Taylor on Facebook, was asking if we've got a restock on uh, our whole sports axes in Ottawa. Um, that's through our, our sister brand, Ken of Inglewood. And we, we've had a bit of a tough time getting axes because, uh, well, you know, COVID's a thing right now and, uh, and a lot of shipments have been delayed. Um, but we've got 100 or so splitting axes coming later this year. So um, make sure you go on the website, sign up for the back and stock notifications, and we'll let you know when we, we get some stocks. Um, we're, we're hoping to get some soon, but we don't know when exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Brad, Brad Bill, again, on Facebook says that he's, You've been using the rust eraser, especially to repair some old kitchen shears. Um, and it got rid of like all the rust, like just made them spotless again, which I'm, I'm really happy to hear, Brad. Yeah, there you go. Um, um, and then, uh, oh, go the, ahead there. No, no, Instagram says like some knives um, are single bevel, some knives are ja like some Japanese knives are single bevel, some knives are double bevel. What the, for those who don't really know about these, uh, these things, um, I'll little talk a little bit about yeah. it. Most knives, Japanese, European, well, mostly European knives are double beveled. 
they are sharpened from this side and this side is an eagle. This one here is double bevel Japanese knife. Where Japanese, um, like sushi chefs and those uh, people working at the uh, traditional Japanese restaurants, they do prefer so-called single bevel. What that means is that like something like this, um, sharpened only one side on the back side, it's totally flat or it actually has a little bit of concave. Um, that is very traditional um, knife that the sushi chefs and uh, those people prefers to use. Um, it can get very nice uh, fine edge to it, but the uh, it is a little bit more hard to use. So um, I like if you say for looking for a uh, multi-purpose knife, I would usually recommend something that's double beveled. Um, Sean on Facebook's uh, wondering. He says for a knife that's got a concave main bevel, like kind of like how the Masakage knives are just slightly concave when they're brand new. Yep. Um, do you just have to make an educated guess as to what angle you're going to set it out at, or or how would you go about setting the angle when you're so when the, you're hot rodding it, Ra rather the, like as opposed to doing the moritaka? Yeah, setting those the uh, the so reason why the uh, those Masakage knives has tiny bit of concave uh, like that is that the uh, they use stones like these you see here the uh, it's real they use it so much much more bigger stone like this but when they do uh, put the bevel on the stone like this it can get actually a uh, concave um concave edge is a little bit of hard um i how when i sharpen those we only sharpen them on the flat, flat stone. So there will be a spot that doesn't touch on the stone. Sometimes I do hide them. The, uh, there are a couple, I've, I've been talking to a couple of people about that. And uh, what they say is that um, they usually leave them because it's not going to, it's just really going to affect on uh, uh, the look of the knife. Um, and also, even if you try them, try to hide them tiny bit by using that the like finger stones uh, for those of you like the like stones like these small stones, finger stones to uh, sharp like take basically buff them or the uh, uh, polish them. You're still re removing a little bit of steel off, and you are basically exacerbating that the uh, concave uh, by doing so. Um, so. Um, I, I totally see the point as well, but also it leaves the deep scratches if I don't do it. So um, mm. I usually I, do a little bit of polish to make it look prettier. I, I hot rodded my uh, my Masakage Zero yesterday mm. at home. And the first time I did it, I was doing it by hand on, on stone. So I didn't get rid of that whole, like you'll, you'll get different kinds of polish on the bevel yeah. and, and it, didn't look super pretty after the first time, but then I hot rodded it for the second time yesterday and it got rid of that entirely. And now it's just basically a yeah. straight bevel so, yeah. and it, it cuts super well. Yeah, so as you sharpen more, you will start to uh, grind that part up, down anyways. So that's what the, uh, the, uh, the person I went to get that little sharpening lessons from. I, last year around this time of the year, I think, yeah, right around. Uh, I get to go to Japan, and it was like a uh, year before I went, before the, it was called pandemic. It was the, uh, <laughs> um, it was just the, uh, you know, weird virus going around. Uh, I was in Japan, I think, this time of the year, and um, I get to actually uh, learn um, really nerdy uh, part of knife sharpenings uh, uh, by this uh, sharpener called the uh, Masashi Fujiwara-san. And that's what, how I, that's who I uh, asked to. It was like, yeah, I, I just, he, he said he just leaves them because, you know, as, as Nathan mentioned, as you sharpen it more, it will eventually come, uh, like come out, right? Right, yeah. And it, if you're okay with it not looking absolutely perfect the first time you sharpen it, yeah. it you, you'll stop noticing it pretty quickly and then the second time you hot rod it, it'll it'll just look good as new. I on uh, on Sunday on Knifewear Instagram, I'm going to be posting an Instagram reel of the, the whole process of hot rodding that knife. So uh, Sean, if you want to see how that how it looks before and after, just just hit us up on Instagram and, and we'll yeah. post that on Sunday. Um, Fighting Yusek, who who also tunes into a lot of these videos, 
he's just saying barkeeper spread is great. Um, it's awesome for stainless pans, um, which I didn't know. So I'm going to, I have a lot of like enamel cast iron and, and stainless pans that are really gross on the outside. I'm going to try it out on that. Um, but he said it's, it's not the same as other cleaners like Hallman. It's very, a very different product. Yeah. So, um, and then while you're, what, yeah. are you, are you on to the next step there, Nato? No, go ahead. Uh, well, we've, we've got a bit of a, a long question, a long answer. So do you have some more sharpening to go? Should we get yeah. into it or, uh, sure. all right, awesome. Well, so, yeah. uh, Grant, Grant Hendrick on YouTube, you know, he's got a good question because this is something people talk about, about Japanese knives a lot online. He says, um, first of all, thanks for the live chat. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to know before purchasing a knife, how can you determine if it's been overground? Um, are there any finishes that are best to spot it, like like visually? Um, and, and how frequent of a problem is it? I know this is something people talk about, about certain lines of knives. Um, it's not a problem I've really encountered a lot, but you know, you're the expert. What do you think about knives being overground? Is it a problem? Is there, should he be on the lookout for it? The, um depends on how you determine the overground definitely if you see some people over like see as overground as the uh the spot one spot has the overground has the if it has a lower spot and comes back down and that is a problem because when you're trying to cut on the cutting board trying to cut a green onions and such the low spot doesn't touch on the cutting board and leaves that the uh leaves all you know you know the, the green onion doesn't cut all the way through it, right? Um, uh, so that is a problem, definitely. Um, so if that, if he, if he means the overground that, um, there are some knife, like, most knife makers gotten actually really much, much better in terms of that kind of stuff now. The, uh, we had a little problems before with the Fujara-san, but we, we get, those knives actually from um, certain person who actually does check everything. And if it needs to, he actually uh, sharpened them before he <laughs> ships out. So uh, our Fujara-san's knives are better than actually most um, knives, uh, Fujara-san's knives from the uh, other people. I have seen- It helps to have friends in Japan, eh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have seen some comments that the Moritaka had the some overground edge and I haven't seen them for a little while now. So they, they have gotten probably much better on that way. Um, Masakages are pretty good. Um, what, how they do is that they use that the big press to cut out the shape. So um, I see very little overgrind from, uh, from their knives. Um, if you, um, ah, sorry. I was just going to say, Grant, if you're ever looking to buy a certain knife, if you're looking on, on Knifeware, like on our website, knifeware.com, just shoot us a message. We've got a live chat on our website during business hours or email uh, hello at knifeware.com. And we would be happy to inspect the knives ourselves. We yeah. do inspect every knife before it goes out. Um, there's a possibility that we might miss something minor. But um, if you get in touch with us either before you order or, or just after you order, we'll, we'll – send you pictures of what we have in stock we almost always have more than one knife of a certain knife often several um and we can we can help you choose the best one we'll make sure you get exactly the knife that you want rather than um just sort of like a random knife so so just get in touch if you're ever looking or, or you're ever concerned about that hope that helps and uh, he also says yeah sorry the uh, oh go ahead now so. if you mean overgrind I mean the uh, this concave edge, the bevels being overground. Um, I'll usually ask for the picture and see how much the core steel is exposed. Uh, oftentimes, the over the bevel overground, like the concave edge, has a tiny bit more, like the core exposed more than the. Uh, mm. the and, and that's what he was talking about, like on the side of the knife. So, like if you look at this guy, the exposed mm. core steel, it's a pretty consistent thickness all the way along like there's some spots like here where it's a little higher but yeah. overall it's it's pretty good so that but that's what you'd want to take a look for based yeah. on what Nauta's saying yeah and uh, what what it means is that like for those of you who don't really who don't who not really familiar with the, how the Japanese knives are made uh, Japanese knives are made with core one hard core steel softer steel on the outside 
this softer steel will protect the knife from say breaking in half and everything, right? So um, it's great um, to have them on the outside. Like the protection, it's like a bubble wrap, right? But the, um, if that is exposed too much, it is more, much more fragile. It is vulnerable. It's like prone to chipping so much more. So you have to be a little bit more careful about how, yeah, like how much the core you see on that knife as well. So I have been sharpening. I was sharpening on the, this one here and I switched because I did thin one side enough. How you can tell if the eye sharpened enough? Two ways. The uh, one, you do it enough that you start to feel so-called the burr, uh, B-U-R-R. -R. It's that little metal folding, uh, start to fold into the one side. You can feel them by running your uh, thumb or finger like this. Don't run it like this because the burr is tiny metal, um, like, yeah, tiny metal that actually cuts you here. So I usually run my uh, finger like this to see if there is actually a burr forming. Um, you don't have to do it all the way. Sometimes you do, but if you grind too much, you start to lose the, uh, the profile too. So um, look where you're sharpening. Your eyes are a very strong tool when it comes to the sharpening. So see where you are sharpening and see how much um, you have to remove till to get to this a uh, micro bevel. Another point is that I have been testing that the thinness of the knife with well, fingers for sure. But how I do is I put the, uh, my, well, you can probably do it an index finger and your thumb, or I usually use the, uh, those tools, these two fingers. And I pinch the edge and see how thin they are. And I've done a few knives, right? So I can kind of tell how thin those knives are. But what, uh, um, if you're not quite sure, you can, uh, you can feel the burr. But generally, that's how I test the, uh, test the knife, the thinness. 220 grit, that's what I'm uh, sharpening on right now. This is a very important step. The, um, Always, when, it, when you're sharpening or even knife making, first step is very important because the, uh, if you don't do this um, enough, what ended up happening is that you are making the edge. Um, you have to, if you make a mistake or if you don't do it enough, um, it's really hard to go back. That's why you do enough on the uh, 220 grit. You make the shape, you make the thinness as, as, thin as you want and you should, then start moving up uh, from there because it's the, it's really hard to go back. You know, once you finish on the 4,000 stone and it feels like it's not doing as, as much as you should, you have to go back down quite a bit. So uh, make sure you get- it's like, when, it's like when you finish the job and you're stropping and then you realize there's a chip in the knife still that you missed. Exactly. Yeah, I've done a few times. So- <laughs> Me too. <laughs> 220 grit, I uh, thin out quite a bit. I'm going up to, uh, you can either do some small steps like a 500, um, but I was just gonna go on this stone here. I should probably do something that we sell. So I am, so today I usually use three stones to get a really nice uh, finish and a finish on these, namely, 220 grit, 1,000, and uh, 4,000. Today, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to use is the uh, four stones. Um, I will have two 1,000 grit stone because oftentimes when, the, when we thin our knives, we use the, the little wheel like this or like this. Uh, it is it is in the repair, so uh, we're actually gonna get the uh, new puri puri pretty soon. But the um, when you use those machines, it's 
it's not wrong to use machines because if you see any of the knife makers, sharpeners in Japan, that's what they use. But it's how is more important. Uh, you know, you have to do, if you just finish everything on those stones, it's not really great because you ended up having that little bumps on that the bevel where finishing on those stones will ensure that there is no uh, bumps here. What that means is that I don't have that much bumps with the uh, this stone, but sometimes this bevel can have a little bit of uh, bumps like this, unevenness, especially using those machines, right? So I like to do is, what I like to do is to uh, make sure my bevel here that I'm sharpening is super flat. So how I can tell, use very hard stone to sharpen them. So what happens is that if there is any low spots, um, the stone doesn't touch, right? So I'm going to make sure that this bevel is nice and flat. Um, one thing that you have to be really, like you could use something that's really soft from this point, but softer stone can say accommodate. It's like softer stone. So it can actually touch on the low spots and high spots at the, all the same time. Where harder stones, they, they only touch where they don't, they don't give. Where the softer stones, as much, there are stones, they still can like give a little bit that actually touches like whole all the way. Hopefully, it makes. Can I, sense. can I jump in with a couple quick questions while you yeah. while you're doing that? Yeah. Uh, well, well, Grant on on YouTube, you, we were talking to him about overgrinds. He just says, you know, thank you so much, and 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 you know the the kind of feedback we gave him was really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Annabelle is wondering. Um, what do you think about using sandpaper to polish the different parts of the blade instead of finger stones? Oh, that's that's fine too. The uh, the I oftentimes like what I like to do um, is the uh, as Nathan was mentioning, and if you see the low spots, uh, ideally you don't work on the low spots so that the uh, as you as you sharp, keep sharpening your knives, the low spots will be gone, right? Like with the five or six different sharpenings. Um, so you don't really have to work on them. Using a sandpaper is great to, um, to hide those uh, low spots. It's kind of really hard way to say. It works in, it works really well. It doesn't work when you try to make your, um, make, make your, uh, this uh, bevel nice and flat because um, sandpapers, I do have sandpapers kicking around and I use them uh, quite occasionally as well. But sandpaper works at the uh, point where your finger is, where um, usually the uh, uh, sharpening stones, they work more as the, uh, the, the face, the whole bevel so that you can see if there's any low spots, high spots, that, that kind of stuff. So I'm not against using the, uh, uh, what you call it, the sandpapers at the end, uh, polishing or finishing process. I'm not really keen uh, to use the sandpaper start, uh, from the get go because again, um, it hides the spots that um, may, sometimes may need a little bit more work. On. Right, so, just, just because it's flexible, it kind of follows the contours exactly, of the blade yeah, as opposed to- Exactly, follow the contours yeah. too much more, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey, uh, James Wang just uh, logged on. He says, hey, long time no see, Naoto. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and then Fighting Yusek, uh, another really good question about stropping. Do you prefer the strop to be uh, uh, dry or like just, I guess, nude? Or do you want, uh, to, do you want to use it with a, a compound or a spray? Um, also, do you use suede like a rougher material or do you use smoother material so if I, when i'm sharpening or when i'm shopping a uh, a kitchen knives i prefer i personally personally <laughs> some people do prefer the uh um um some you know chromium oxide on it i do prefer not 
the um, the reason being is that the uh, those chromium oxides are fantastic if you like those super smooth edge. When you try test the uh, edge on the newspapers, you basically hear like very silky, very quiet. Um, for those of you who like those kind of edge, use those. I personally like slightly more rougher edge because it just uh, feels it cuts a little bit nicer. Um, as, you know, it kind of bites into it. Uh, for those of you who like the bite, um, use it, the, uh, these guys, uh, just the, you know, naked or bare or just the nothing on it. Uh, if you like the, uh, the super smooth, uh, quiet edge, uh, if you're going to finish your kitchen knives up to 8,000, 10,000, use the chromium oxide. That's fantastic. I usually leave them a little bit less, uh, less polish. So, um, I'm, that, I'm, that's, that's good to know because I, I tend to polish up. So it's super, super smooth, just out of habit. Cause that seems better. Um, yeah. But then I often find that when I'm cutting tomatoes and peppers at home, a knife that I sharpened, like I sharpened my, you know, like a, a really nice knife, maybe a month ago, and it's just not cutting, it, you know, it's only been a month and it's not cutting the way it should. So I should just be leaving my edges a little rougher so that they bite a little more, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's, okay, that's cool. Right? Yeah. And, and then Annabelle was, uh, well, Fighting Usyk also says just good answer. He, <laughs> he's a fan of that answer. Um, Annabelle saying they meant more aesthetic for the for the finger stones versus the sandpaper. So yeah, if you're if you're just looking to polish up your bevel at the end of the process, mm -hmm. sandpaper is great for, yeah, for smoothing out those inconsistencies. Yeah, it evens it out very nice as well. So use it. Yeah, use the sandpaper. Just careful, don't the uh, don't come to too close to the edge. So so what are you working on now? So right now I just moved. Uh, up to the, well, no, up. the I, I was using a little bit of harder um, 1,000 grit. Now I move to the bit softer 1,000 grit. Softer 1,000 grit is good because it the, um, it, I, it, it's like a sandpaper. Softer ones touches on the low spots as well. Because I basically sharpen all the low spots or high spots out, I don't have anything on them right now, but the um, this gives the uh, the knife really nice um, smoky look to it. It's just really from here. It's more like a look than anything else. Again, how I sharpen, how I do sharpening, as you can probably see, I check pretty frequently. I do a few strokes and I check them, see where it touches, see if that the finish I'm looking for is attained. And that's very important when you are, uh, when you try to learn how to sharpen them. So yeah, here, the, um, I'm gonna show you how they look and how I, I found the, uh, this spot that's the, uh, that's a little bit, lower spot as well. So here, just kind of like the, I think Instagram has a little bit better camera here. And it's pretty even. And there is a spot here that has the, the very first scratch that's made by the uh, maker. It's maybe a little bit hard. Just gonna do this. Very nice, sorry, it's too close to the camera here. And where my finger is, you may see some little scratch right here. Anyways, this is a low spot. Um, if you keep going, it will uh, remove this, but just gonna leave this one right here as this was almost brand new. Um, Are you this, oh, sorry. Well, I was, I was just gonna say, uh, you, you know what? Continue with your, your your train of thought because I've got a couple more questions, but we can get onto those in a minute. No, I usually change my hand the when I'm actually thinning, when I'm sharpening on the bevel. That will usually be a bit, little bit better, nicer finish. Um, I'm not an ambidextrous. Uh, I, I can't use my chopsticks on my left. That's that's how we can, like Japanese, will tell if you're ambidextrous or not. Um, but the, um, I just learned that the, uh, it's pretty easy because I don't have to keep my angles or anything like that. So I just hold it on my left. 
and move my back and forth. And oh, no, I have trouble. Like when I was hot rodding yesterday, I, I got a really nice polish, like that kind of Kasumi finish that you like to do, where yeah. I, I was finishing up the right side of the bevel on my Arashiyama 6000 and got a nice shiny edge along along the, the exposed carbon steel. And yeah. then the left side of the knife, it was okay, but it's not as nice and it doesn't look as consistent and shiny and pretty. So is that should I just be switching hands to get a, a more consistent finish? Yep. Change, change your hand. Switch your hand. That oh, makes it cool. Good to know. Yeah. Um, uh, Grant's wondering what what grid of sandpaper you'd use when you're working on the bevel of a knife when you're if you are using sandpaper. Um, if I were, depends on how again deep of the scratch that you have on the knife right now. The um, I usually start thinning the knife from the two twenty and goes to one thousand. After 1,000 grit, um, this say uh, sharpening stones, I usually uh, pick up either 800 grit or 1,000 grit sandpaper to start. Um, when I um, do a, uh, so the wheel, when I thin my knife with the coarse wheel and medium grit wheel, medium grit wheel is around 800 grit. When it spins, it gives you much more finer finish to it. So it's equivalent to about the 1200 uh, edge or the polish. But because it leaves pretty uneven, I usually use a little bit of coarser grit, like a 400 or 220. Make sure that the surface is really nice and even. I don't have any wavy marks or anything like that. Then I go up to something like a uh, 800, 1000. And that's usually fine for most the uh, most regular finish, um, where if you want to get a lot more finer, uh, what I've done the other day was the, I uh, started from 400, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, and 5,000. Um, it's all under the, the uh, running water that, the, uh, that gives you a little bit more nicer shine. But I usually start from something a little bit coarser than you would think, because that will evens the uh, evens it out. But most like hardware stores or even woodworking shops sell sandpaper. Um, they, you can often buy like a mix pack, so it'll be like rough grits or fine grits. And, and I would just buy a mix pack of, of finer grit, like automotive sandpaper, it's often called, um, and just experiment, try different finishes out, and and take a day and piss around and, and see what you like the look of the best. Yep. Yeah, get the one with the waterproof one though, because you want to have the water. Water will work as a lubricant and also water. The reason why I'm doing it under running water is that the water will take off the old excess grits or excess a uh, steel that comes up off from the uh, from the, the um, steel. So um, the that that will makes it a little bit more nicer polish on those. Mm. I guess that's another another really important point or kind of reminds me of something that um, isn't necessarily intuitive to everyone is when you are polishing your bevels and your hot rotting knives, when you move from 220 to 1,000 grit, clean your knife off. Like get get it clean because you don't want to contaminate the finer stone with the rougher grits and, and hmm. just waste a bunch of time trying to polish on, on rough grit. Yeah. And try to use a fresh water rather than the uh, water from your pond. <laughs> for the very long time we had this by, by, by pond by pond now to means the sharpening bucket not an actual don't sharpen uh, with pond not water not that's pond. gross <laughs> not actual <laughs> pond. um yeah but so the um i just finished sharpening on the 2000 grit does the terrace would your benefit from the thinning oh yeah sorry i was like looking at the uh Looking at the question on uh, um, Instagram. Terrace Fujiwara knives benefit from thinning? Absolutely. It's going to take such, such fine edge. In fact, I just finished the uh, finished one of the Fujiwara son's knife the other day. Um, his knives are fantastic. It's hard and really, really hard. It keeps the edge very long. It takes such fine edge. He sharpens the last bevel so thin. So I, I haven't seen anyone who sharpens that angle. So it's like one of the sharpest for sure. 
it has a little bit of problem with the fit and finish on the bevel. Sometimes so you see the bevel that has the quite a bit of bump to it. So um, even it's a, uh, I like, even it's really well used for sand knives, thinning will make this bevel so much more nice and even. What it make, what it does is that makes the sharpening from that on easy, much, much easier than used it, it, it is. So um, I'll high, and that's what we do actually, highly recommend. Uh, every time we sharpen Fujara Sans knives, we sharpen uh, by thinning, from start from thinning. Yes. I find, uh, I, I found, but this might also just be hearsay that sharpening his knives, like when you're thinning it out and hot rotting a, a Fujiwara knife, I find it, it takes a really long time. Is that just because of how they're, they're sharpened initially? Or I've heard some people think that they're, the cladding steel is actually harder and more difficult to grind. The, not so much on a white uh, Maboroshi series. Um, the Super Blue, the uh, Denka series is a little bit hard. Um, it just really has that a little bit different. Uh, what what I think is that it does have a little bit of a carbon uh, diffusion going on uh, from the core steel to the cladding steel that makes it a little bit of hard to be ground. But white carbon doesn't have that much of the uh, difference there. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, John on on Facebook says uh, says beautiful job now, Tell. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and Grant really appreciates all the tips. Uh, really, really excited to put those into, into use. Um, we've got a couple mentions about uh, sharpening convex edges. Uh, James Wang's just saying it's been learning um, how to sharpen on convex whetstones. Oh, okay. Sorry. So a couple of different uh, comments, I guess. James Wang's just saying sharpening on convex whetstones kind of fun. Um, but but Michael Fordsman is, is specifically asking, um, would you make a convex edge after you've thinned it out, like after you've gone through this hot rotting process? So there are two different questions here. The uh, sharpening on a convex stone, um, which is really common actually in, uh, in the knife sharpening, especially sword char sharpening uh, swords, um, because convex stones like these can, um, so when I'm, when I'm sharpening the knives, I'm sharpening by the whole surface. There is like probably this much of a spot that's touch, touching on the stone right now, right? Where if you're used to those convex stones, uh, what happens is that it touches on uh, one spot. So if you miss, say if you ha have the low spots like these, it's easier to touch and work on. That's why the sword polishers and sharpeners will like to use those ones rather than the super, super flat ones. Another question, if I, would I make the, um, the bevel convex um, after I do thinning? The answer is I, Moritaka's are hard because Moritaka-san's bevel is very um, narrow and I always just sharpen them super flat. But usually when I'm sharpening a, some other people's knives, what I do is that I do make it a convex and thin at the same time. So the, um, if I, you have the bigger bevel, that's like say like halfway up here, I usually work by sections to make it nicer, Vex edge, which I should talk about it in the uh, some other uh, other part, other time because this show is not only just one time. I'm going to do it every week. Topics changes, so if you have any things that you want to hear, you have you want to um, you know want to see, you want to ask, just stay tuned. Um, you know, tune back in on the Fridays on um, 4 p.m. Mountain Time. That's what I, that's what we like to do. Okay, so um, does it make sense, Nathan? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and, and I was just gonna say like really, really good questions that we've had today. Um, Everybody is kind of coming at us, uh, asking about some like really technical knowledge, which we, we really appreciate. This is 
this is the point of, of advanced knife sharpening. Um, you know, we teach more basic introductory knife sharpening classes every uh, every week on Thursday nights. Uh, we've got lots of great videos on our YouTube channel that Nauta's made, but um, it's, it's not as often that we get into this really intense level of knife sharpening um, because that's not what all of our customers are looking to learn. So uh, we really appreciate you guys tuning in uh, and, and listening to us get really, really technical because um, I know some of you are looking for a really uh, serious in-depth knowledge about knife sharpening and I'm glad we can help provide that. And yeah, we, we're doing it all three platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, you know, I, I think YouTube is great because you don't have to have an account to tune in. But the Instagram yeah. is great because the uh, I usually set up my camera like all oh, four. Oh, I, I I wasn't really looking, but you can see the camera right here. So it's a little bit closer, and the quality is great as well. Where the I I have to use the uh, the regular uh, Apple uh, computers, uh, which we'll call it the the camera that doesn't really always have the great quality right now. We're, 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 we're looking at some strategies to improve our live videos. Um, we, we've actually got, I guess now while you're, you're polishing that knife is a good time to talk about this where myself and, and the rest of the team have um, some, some really exciting plans in the works to improve our videos, put some, some uh, really high quality content out on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. hopefully improve the quality of our live videos as well. I think we're going to get some higher quality webcams and microphones for our live videos. Um, so if anybody has, because we just like to, you know, serve you folks better and, and do a better job of this. So if anybody has suggestions or, 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 or you know, things they would like us to do differently or better, um, you know, we're all ears. We love the feedback that everybody's been giving us. So, yep. uh, you know, email email me, uh, Nathan at Nightwear.com. Or just leave a comment on any of our videos, message us on social media, because we, we always appreciate the feedback. Um, we yeah. also appreciate the uh, 200 or so people that subscribed to us on YouTube yesterday, because uh, I sent out an email about our, our live videos, and oh, nice. uh, a whole bunch of folks just followed us on YouTube. If you're if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, we would hugely appreciate it. Um, you know, we're trying to build it up as a community where people can learn and share knowledge together and talk about knives and cooking and food and all this great stuff that we like uh, and, and of course knife sharpening so um on on <laughs> on youtube fighting he's six asking if chris made friends with the firefighters yesterday um now to, did you hear about that it's, oh yeah i did i, I did <laughs> yeah chris was searing off some lamb necks and got the fire department called on him um keep an eye on instagram fighting you sick i'm gonna and i think on youtube too i'm gonna post the uh, a super cut of, of him getting the fire department showing up because it was pretty entertaining. Um, uh, Yusik and, and Grant are also saying, um, oh, we, yeah, we tried to feed the firefighters, but they weren't very receptive. But uh, Yusik and Grant um, also saying they would love some uh, demos on convex uh, stones. Are you guys wondering about turning your stones convex or making a convex grind? Because they're two different processes. And we'd love to uh, we'd love to know what you want to see because maybe we can do that next week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and as I as I was like showing off as 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 the uh, Nathan was talking, I was just showing off some of the knives here. Um, thinning is done. I did from so 220, 1,000, another another soft 1,000, and 2,000. And went from there, uh, moved to the uh, so-called, some of the natural whetstones. This is the Tango um, Auto, the blue stone here. Uh, gives you really nice uh, uh, Kasumi finish. And also I did the, uh, on uh, Maruyama uh, Shiro Suita. And for those of you who is uh, nerdy enough, I finished at the, with the, uh, this super tiny stone here called the Uchigumori. This is the stone to polish the uh, sword with usually. From here, it's going back to basic. What it is, is that, so I've sharpened, I thin the bevel already. So I'm going to give a 15 degrees from here to up a little bit use strokes. I've thinned this knife enough that it doesn't take much to actually raise a burr. Do that again with the, uh, the other side. 
This is so, one. So Yusuk and Grant both want to see um, a video on convex grinds on blades. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you think we could teach that next next Friday at four? I, I will uh, get the some knives that's appropriate for that the uh, for that demo next week. Cool. So yeah, tune in next week, guys. Friday at four Mountain Time, same as today. And yeah. we'll uh, well, <laughs> I won't do anything. I'll just sit here. But now till we'll uh, we'll sharpen that uh, a convex grind for you. Yep, we'll uh, we'll cover that the little convex grind. Um, there are several ways that you could do. Uh, if you um, if you see someone use those like, belt sanders, uh, they just push it in, <laughs> and uh, um, it could make a convex grind. You, um, we don't use that. We just use those hands or some some of the very easy wheels. But um, um, you have to be really careful, especially when you're using that. Uh, bell sanders. I haven't used um, low spinning bell sanders some uh, knife sharpeners use, so I can't really make a big judgment call, but you just have to be careful that you don't see much sparks coming out or you don't heat up your steel that you can't like, you know, can't touch it and any longer because the, uh, if you heat up these knives, especially say like, like the, what I know is that the, those Japanese knives or quenched at very high temperature, like the carbon steels around 800 degrees, where they are so-called tempered at 180 degrees or two, 180 degrees to 200 degrees, which is like oven temperature, if you think about it, right? It's like 350 um, Fahrenheit. It's, it's not that it's hot, hot compared to like the thousand degrees they forge yeah, at. Yeah, it's hot, but it can, uh, reach to the point pretty quick if you you know leave your uh, knife on that the the bell sander that you know uh, spins super super fast right so um, that's something you have to be careful um, as far as I can see like a lot of knife sharpeners knife makers who does sharpen on the wheels uh, for the first they you know don't, you don't see much uh, sparks coming out and seems like they could still touch the uh, touch the knife so. I'm pretty okay with that, but uh, just be careful. Uh, if you see that knife sharpeners use just a bell sander and like, that kind of stuff, I I wouldn't I wouldn't believe those people. A be um, couple more questions on on YouTube. Uh, James is asking, uh, and, and you're gonna have to translate for me because I can say these words, but I don't know what they mean. He say uh, he's getting some uh, Hazuya. Jizuya and Nugui for polishing my Hanyaki. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what Hanyaki is. Just wondering what your thoughts are. The uh, Jizuya and Hazuya, I did ask, I actually had a little conversation with the, uh, the Imanishi-san who gets our, uh, we, who got our um, a, uh, Uchigumori from. Uh, what he said is that the uh, biggest difference is that the hardness of the stone. Jizuya is the, uh, this uh, base, to polish that the softer stone, Hazia is for the uh, harder part. Um, natural stones are really hard. And answer that I got is that the, uh, you, basically what they do is the, uh, they use it on that knife or use it on the things that they want to use, then determine which one is Hazia, which one is Jizia. And I've asked it this specific question on this, are these like Jizuya or the Hazia? They're like, eh, can't really tell because the uh, each layers, each spots are so different. Um, but th that's the how that the differences are. So I don't, so you can't really, um, unless you test it on your knife, uh, it's really hard to tell if, if it's either for that uh, purpose. Um, that the usually the uh, something that you have to be a little bit careful is that the uh, if you're polishing the honyakis um, using any uchigomori, uchigomoris are fantastic, but the uchigomori won't leave the uh, what we call, what you may think it's the super super fine um, you know polish on uh, the hard part, right? So I would usually use that the uchigomori for the uh, those um, just above the hamon line to get the nice nice finish. But everything else may be a little bit hard. Yeah, sorry, Hazuya and Jizuya is like very sword terms. So not many people know about those. Uh, that's super cool. I'm, I'm learning something every day. 
Um, <laughs> speaking of harder and softer stones, um, Annabelle's wondering when you change so to a softer stone, are you putting on the same pressure as you would a harder stone, or are you using less pressure on the knife? I'm using about the same pressure. Um, it, I'm not putting a lot of pressure when I'm sharpening anyway, so um, about the same. I may use a little bit shorter strokes when I'm doing on a softer stone. The base, softer stones for me is really to get that the nice, um, what we call it the kasumi or a little bit more smoky finish. So I do a little bit more shorter strokes where harder stones, I do a little bit longer strokes to see um, if that the knife, the bevel is true. That's probably the difference that I, that I, mm. if, I if I do some difference there. Okay, um, and, and uh, Ted is wondering about something. Ted, you might want to go back to the earlier part of the video once we're done, but because we did talk about this earlier today, but Ted is a great question. It's always important to know about. Uh, recommendations for thinning knives with concave grind. He's got a Yukurosaki Guto. Um, he's tried to thin it a couple times with mixed results. He says he can't get the knife flush enough to move the cladding line up without scratching the Shinobi line. The um, oftentimes the uh, those knives that's have the, uh, the quite a bit of concave on it. A uh, few ways that you can do is to uh, if you don't mind those scratches, it does not affect on your um, on that the knife like cutting ability and sharpness. Leave it, and as you uh, keep sharpening it, it will eventually come off. Another trick that I use sometimes do is to uh, uh, use, because it leaves quite deep scratches if you're using a, a coarser stone, we do keep those uh, finger stones handy. This is uh, the just broken off 220 grit. And oftentimes how I do is that the, uh, I put on those like uh, stones and I do make them, I do make them like, I do use my wrist to make them a little bit more round. So that rounded side will touch on that the uh, bevel, the lower spots a little bit nicer. Starting from here, I do go up to a little bit more finer. Then you could you definitely use the sandpapers to polish. That's how I would do for the Kurosakis, uh, especially the um, um, Senko, uh, Shizuku, any of those ones got a little bit more fine, like, polisher like shinier finish i do coarse and make it probably all the way up to 1000 grit on the that stone then i do i may just do um, several different sandpapers to polish them up that's, that's how i will i if i were yeah if i were to sharpen and if i were to thin those knives that has a very bad uh, concave uh, that's what i would do mm -hmm. so yeah i could uh, i I could I could talk about those uh, concave ones the uh, uh, not not the next week because next week I'm I'm talking about the uh, convex but you know what let's let's keep that in mind because the uh, I do see more and more people are trying to get into that kind of sharpening and the um, I think it's very beneficial to talk about these a um, little bit more again like I I am very pleased to. Um, have that those questions come up because the it's um it's great that we get to uh, talk about them and to be quite honest right they, it happens some of them some the knife makers has more than others and sometimes it's like ah why <laughs> but the uh, it, there's ways around them that the uh, so let's let's talk about you know bring 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 that up and at the next uh, next uh, next week's video. Yeah. And, and the more you guys tell us what you want to see, the better. Like we're, you know, we're just doing what we think is cool. We're talking about things that we think people need to know. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, the audience is the only reason we're doing this. So uh, if, if you folks want to see specific techniques or you want now to speak, teach specific things, um, I mean, he's, he's the expert and, and he's happy to kind of answer any questions you have in a class. We do this every single Friday, 4 p.m. Um, so just let us know what you want to see, right? Um, if you don't think of anything today, uh, shoot us a message, um, and we'll be happy to uh, we'll be happy to accommodate. Yeah, and most. Uh, uh, sorry. 
No, go ahead, man. No, like most of these videos will be uploaded on the, um, the Instagram, YouTube, Facebook um, after the fact. So you can watch yep. them later as well. It's, it's a little bit more boring after, but uh, and we've, we've been trying to create more and more video content that you guys can watch at home, like five minutes, 15 minutes, that kind of stuff, right? So um, yeah, totally. stay tuned. Um, yeah. No, Nolan H says, please make a major repair video. Nolan, <laughs> that'll be, because it takes a long time to do that, that'll be something that we record, edit together into like a really nice looking video. Um, but we definitely have plans to shoot some more long form videos with Naoto. Um, he's got some great knife sharpening videos on our YouTube channel that you can go and watch as a whole playlist. Um, and so we'll have him and Francis to make, uh, we'll get them to make more like intense um, kind of repair videos uh, this year. Um, if you follow Naoto on Instagram, uh, Naoto, at Naoto KW, N-A-O-T-O-K-W, um, he does some pretty intensive uh, repairs. Oh, he says he's watched all of our, uh, all of our, uh, well, all of your uh, sharpening videos. So thanks, man. But yeah, um, Nato does some intensive repairs on his Instagram account, and we'll definitely bring some of those onto the YouTube channel too. Yeah. Alrighty, I think that uh, the um, wraps good. Or just can, can I can I chuck two more questions at you? If you guys have questions, now is your last time to get in. Your last chance to get in. Um, sure. Fighting music, great, great comment. Uh, it's important for people to realize that scratches will happen. Your knives are not going to be polished perfectly all the time, um, and that's a very realistic way to look at it. Uh, even when you're sharpening, you're going to get some scuffs that you don't expect. Don't let it, you know, ruin your day. Just, just move on with it. And, and, uh, and you'll love the knife more for having a few of those battle scars. Um, Yusik asks, how obsessive are we about, uh, about flattening our stones? Uh, pretty much the, um, we use the, um, especially when you're sharpening a, uh, um, single bevel, uh, single bevel knives, especially when I'm sharpening a, a back of the single bevel knives, this part needs to be super, super flat. We do have these stones, which we are getting pretty soon, a little more soon, hopefully, is that the, um, we do sell these Atoma diamond plate. These are great to flatten your stones, but the, uh, we have these, that's the Kensho diamond plate that is about as twice as thick, they uh, this guy here uh, who I went to um, went to get the uh, get the lessons from. Um, he is super nerd. He uh, he basically made this uh, stone truer than the uh, factory truth. He actually touches up before <laughs> he puts the, the bases on. Um, wow. So um, I do chew the uh, stones quite frequently. Um, Probably a little, I should do it a little bit more often. When I'm working on the uh, bevels, a little less, but when I'm working, especially doing a, a back of the, uh, um, back of the, the single bevels, I do, I do actually flatten like every single time. Every single few strokes, see that line, I just flatten them and try it again as well. So that, but, yeah, I, we're pretty, pretty anal about the flatness of the stone. That's why I don't have the, if you want to get a really, really super true, get those, uh, the metal chewing stones rather than the regular ones. Yeah, definitely. They're, they just make life so much better and they're so much faster too, um, especially if you sharpen professionally. But even if it's just a hobby, like I, I sharpen knives as more of a hobby these days and um, flattening stones. I like flat stones, but they're a big pain, especially when you're doing a, a repair or something and having a metal flat, a truing plate, you know, it's a hundred bucks, but it saves you hours of your time <laughs> and it, it's well, well worth the money. Um, last comment, James just said, speak of concave surfaces, I recently polished a Hanyaki Yanagiba and the Hira part uh, had a huge low spot. It took more than two hours on a 220 stone to flatten it out. Uh, well done for sticking through that, James. That's a lot of work, and I probably would have given up well before that. That's a lot of work. The, um, this, this is why we use the machines behind Nauto, because they're the same as sharpening by hand, but they're much faster. Especially this guy is fine, because it's the, uh, it's just, the reason why that the ECBO or those uh, concave or the low spots happens that the, oftentimes they just use these guys, right? Um, and what they finish is that they use buffing wheels and everything. So you, they never really um, puts on the, the like sharpening stones to finish off most, most of the times. 
So uh, you leaving, they could leave a little bit of low spots like that. Um, it's a natural, it happens. Um, I like to see Honyaki not having that kind of stuff because near Honyaki with low spots is very pain. As I said, no ago, like low spots will not affect on the cutting, um, the, the ability or the uh, performance of the knife. So you don't have to worry too much about them. But the, uh, yes, I would like to see those finish a little bit more nicer. Um, but it's, it's hard. Um, yeah. 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 We are, um, for those of you who's like nerd enough, uh, we are going to get a lot more um, nice knives uh, from different knife makers and blacksmith um, soon ish i'm pretty excited I, I think we have to because we can't get enough knives from anybody <laughs> we don't have any knives so we just need to get them from everybody well those of you who's super fan of the damascus knife we just got a one knife from this uh, knife maker called the um uh, hashimoto san he's an artist Ooh. he's a uh he's not a he wasn't really a kitchen knife maker but he's an artist he, we just got the uh, super cool damascus knives from him uh, we have an order from the uh, Monaka-san, the uh, Aogami number two and Aogami number two in the soft steel Damascus and Aogami number one in the core uh, that is uh, hopefully coming in by May. Anyways, cool. thanks for watching. I've been, you thanks know, I, everybody. I will keep kind of throwing those like um, cool, fun information uh, time to time, but the, thanks for watching. Yeah. We'll come back like every uh, every Friday. Um, talk about you know sharpening and stuff. So stay yep. stay. Yeah. Um, so, tomorrow is uh, is some knife skills. Chris Lord and Jeevan are going to teach um, some different knife skills, different cutting techniques. They're going to talk about Yuto's versus Sentoku's versus Nakiri. So if anybody watching right now is into cooking, um, which if you like knives, you probably are. Um, knife skill 101 Saturday, 2 p.m. Mountain Time tomorrow. Um, and then we're back every uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday with Japanese Knife 101 at 2 Mountain Time. Uh, Thursdays at 7.15 is uh, p.m. is Sharpening Night in Canada, basic knife sharpening technique. And then now comes back every Friday at 4. Um, real quick before we go as well, we just got a big restock, uh, an order that we've been waiting for for a month. Finally made it through customs, finally showed up in our warehouse. Our, our amazing warehouse team unpacked it and received it today. So all of the knifeware sharpening stones are restocked, our sharpening kits, um, all of our, well, not all of our, but some of the Conroe grills are in stock for a, a short period of time until they sell out again. Um, so if you're looking for sharpening stones or a Conroe grill, grab it this weekend because they probably won't be around after that. Uh, the sharpening stones, though, will be around for, for, for Overall, quite a while. Maybe uh, may become available actually a uh, Monday. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Good to know. So, like, if you don't see the Conro being available, just wait for a little while. We, uh, we, they should be available pretty soon, as well. So, yeah. Thanks for cool. watching. Um, and thanks we'll everyone. See you. Uh, see you soon. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everybody. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.